Please join me today welcoming one of our own, welcoming home, Rear Admiral John Kirby. challenges. And, and of course, I also want to thank you, sir, for your support of the men and women of the Armed Forces. Every member of Congress uh, works hard on our behalf, and we know that. And I know you do as well, sir. So please, uh, I want to thank you for that. And I'd like, please, if we could give the congressman a round of applause. I commend St. Petersburg College, President Baum, uh, and the staff and faculty here in particular for hosting this conference, and, uh, and I want to note the achievements of Dr. James Oliver as well, uh, Mr. David Clement and the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. In organizing this event, as well as so many other fora, they have ma mastered the art of creating an atmosphere in which both sides are fairly heard, in which civility reigns, and in which the greatest traditions of the village square that our colonial ancestors so perfected still survives. And they managed to accomplish all this in an age when interpersonal communication and enlightenment are often easily pursued, or so we think, in 140 characters or less. Now, that's no mean feat, and I applaud you all for that. And I'll no doubt post that on my Twitter account this afternoon. <laughs> uh, uh, I am uh, absolutely delighted to be back home. Uh, the salt in the air, the gulf breezes I was talking about, maybe going for a run a little bit later today. This is amazing weather. The pelicans, the Spanish moths. The Navy has sent me all around the world, but it has never sent me anywhere where the sun shines more brightly, the faces are friendlier, or the smoke mullet tastes any better than right <laughs> That definitely deserves applause. My mom's going to make her world-famous rigatoni for me tonight, but I have a feeling that I'm still going to end up at Ted Peters a little bit later. Yeah. Um, well, as Congressman Jolly pointed out, I've just wrapped up a tour as Pentagon. During my 28 years in uniform, 25 of which were spent doing public affairs work, uh, I've been blessed to work for some incredible leaders and to witness some remarkable developments in historic events. In many of those events, particularly over the last several years, I have been much less a participant than I have been a communicator, charged with helping senior leaders explain the decisions they made, and in some cases doing the explaining myself. So today I want to offer you, policymakers in your own right, or soon to be, certainly in the case of our young students here today, a little advice about how the best decisions are often reached, and just as critically, how they are best communicated. So today, if you'll allow me, I would like to be your public affairs officer. Now to give you the full Pentagon experience, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms. <laughs> Why? Well, because that's how we do it up there yeah, in the five-sided palace. Um, we can't start the day without a good sit rep situation report. We don't end the day without a good COB report, close of business. And we absolutely won't go anywhere without being in the UOD, uniform of the day, which for me today is STP, Service Dress Blues. <laughs> so here we go. Your first acronym is NDBIT. That's N-D-B-I-T. Before I tell you what it means, I want to tell you a story. It is February 2012, Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. A small number of U.S. troops, while trying to prevent communications between captured insurgents, burned copies of the Quran and other religious materials. The act is witnessed by local Afghans, who try to stop it, but not before several of the holy books are destroyed. Protests erupt at the site and outside the base. The protests spread quickly to other parts of the country. Some of those protests turn violent, fueled by the Taliban who try to exploit what they see as American insensitivity. After five days of protests, 
30 people are killed, including four Americans. Two of those Americans, two of those Americans were gunned down at their desks working at the Ministry of Interior. Indeed, that year would see more than 40 coalition troops murdered at the hands of what appeared to be their fellow Afghan soldiers. Almost immediately, the commander on the ground of U.S. and coalition forces, Marine General John Allen, removes the advisors from all the other ministries and orders commanders to enact whatever force protection measures they, they deemed appropriate at the time. He then visits troops in the field, and he brought a camera crew with him. Allen urges the troops not to overreact, to remember who they are and the purpose for which why they, they're there, helping the Afghans prepare to take over combat operations inside their own country. We must show the Afghan people, Allen said, that as bad as that act was, it was unintentional. And Americans and ISAF soldiers do not stand for this. We stand for something greater than that. The video of his lecture goes viral in a matter of hours. Back in Kabul the next day, Allen's advisors pepper him with new ideas to improve the security situation. Suspend all training, one of them suggested. Establish a multi-agency working group, said another. Beef up the counterintelligence teams, said the third. Allen took it all in, but he shook his head. Nidbit, he said. Nidbit. Everybody but me understood what he was talking about and shuffled out the door. I stayed behind. I had to know. It's a lesson I learned from a mentor a long time ago, the general said. It means no decision before it's time. Good leaders, he went on, make the tough calls when they need to make them, not a moment before. Don't allow yourself to be pressured artificially, he said. That's when you make mistakes, not good decisions. Alan looked up at me from his papers, and he said, I will not rush to failure. It sounds simple, and it is, but it can be a frustratingly difficult rule to apply in the face of unrelenting public attention and the hyperactive social media environment in which we all live today. One's instinct is to act quickly, even completely, to make the pressure go away. But of course, a major story like that does not go away easily, nor should it. This was a critical time in Afghanistan, a dangerous time. And the Afghan people, the American people, our troops and their families, were as well served by responsible coverage of these events by reporters as they were by the thoughtful, deliberate, and reasoned policy decisions of General Allen, who made sure that reporters knew every step he took. He would eventually, in concert with his Afghan partners, enact most of the suggestions that his advisors posed, and a few more. And though 2012 would see insider attacks peak, it wouldn't be long before the effects of his new policies would take root. Today, the Afghans are fully in command of combat operations, and insider attacks, though still a risk, have been dramatically reduced. A leader who follows the nidbit rule not only makes better tactical decisions, he or she also makes better policy, and therefore sends a stronger message about the type of organization they lead. Such an organization, even when in the wrong, can fall back on sound principle, self-correct smartly, and communicate more openly, and therefore is much more credible in the public sphere. Just a few weeks ago, we were asked to respond to claims by anonymous sources that Sergeant Bo, Bo Bergdahl would be imminently uh, facing charges for desertion. Upon verifying that not only were the claims false, but that the Army would not, under any circumstance, allow themselves to rush to judgment, we were able to stop the story right in its tracks. Now, as I'm sure you've seen today and this week, uh, the Sergeant uh, was in fact charged with desertion. But back then, when I stood up in front of reporters, all I had to say was no decision before it's time. Nip it. Now your second acronym for the day is KIP. K-I-P. K-I-P means keep it in perspective. You are not only responsible for the pace of your decisions, you're responsible for putting them in proper context. We live in a world, I call it a post-audience world, where people, be they your employees, the media, the public at large, are no longer satisfied simply by knowing what you are doing to earn their confidence, their trust, and in fact their support, you must help them understand why you are doing it. KIPP is about understanding yourself and then revealing, and this is really the important part, revealing the intellectual underpinning for your decision. And it's about using that underpinning to guide you as you make more. The first step in this process is understanding the future you seek. Not just your immediate goals for the next year, two, or three, but the long-term future. Then you have to align that future to your core values, the core values you hold yourself, your institution, your community. And finally, you need to understand how your decisions relate to the larger whole, to others that you have made in similar circumstances or in other programs or other departments. To kip well 
is to step back and take a longer, larger view before you step in and make that decision. Let me offer another example. It's February 2010, Washington, D.C. The gallery at the hearing room for the Senate Armed Services Committee is packed with spectators and reporters. Sitting at the table before those committee members are Secretary of Defense Bob Gates and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen. The two leaders are there to testify about the Pentagon's don't ask, don't tell policy, a policy that forbade gay and lesbian men and women from serving openly in the armed forces. Secretary Gates will tell the committee he wants to study the issue further and that he intends to commission a team to do just that. Admiral Mullen will concur with that approach. But then the Admiral will go further, further in fact than any other senior military officer had ever gone before on this issue. Speaking for myself and myself only, Mullen said, it is my personal belief that allowing gays and lesbians to serve openly would be the right thing to do. No matter how I look at this issue, I cannot escape being troubled by the fact that we have in place a policy which forces young men and women to lie about who they are in order to defend their fellow citizens. For me, the Admiral continued, it comes down to integrity, theirs as individuals and ours as an institution. There is an audible gasp in the room when Mullen says this, and people realize the weight of what he just said. Reporters clack away at their keyboards, filing off alerts to their editors. Some of the senators sit back in their chairs. Many more months of study and debate and decision will lay ahead before Don't Ask, Don't Tell would be taken off the books. But even the most ardent advocate of the policy had to admit that Mullen's testimony proved pivotal in its demise. What they didn't know that cold winter day was the effort and time and care Admiral Mullen took in arriving at that conclusion. He applied lessons from his own experience with gay and lesbian sailors going all the way back to the Vietnam War. He stood up a team to dig up the history of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, to examine the policies and practices of other militaries with respect to gay and lesbian service, to gauge shifting attitudes in America and in the ranks, and to help him think through the ramifications of a change not only in 2010, but many, many years hence. He read and he thought and he spoke to troops from all the services at all levels, privates all the way up to four-star generals. Now, I'm not suggesting that keeping things in perspective means having to exhaustively study every issue like he did this one. Real leadership means not being afraid to act on your instinct as well. And good instincts, such as Mullen's, when it came to the core values of the institution, are easy to defend at the podium. It's very easy for me as his spokesman to talk about how and why he made that decision. What I am suggesting is that you stand back from the crush of headlines, from the power of myth and preconceived notions, and frankly, the myopia that too many of us suffer on a daily basis, and chart a course that, when looked back upon by future generations, will reveal the wisdom and the vitality of your leadership. Authors Richard Neustadt and Ernest May refer to this as seeing time as a stream. In their book, Thinking in Time, which is a terrific, a terrific book, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it for anybody who wants to lead at any level. In that book, they argue that the best leaders see themselves as part of a continuum of events rather than problem solvers of the moment. The essence of thinking in time streams, they write, is imagining the future as it may be when it becomes the past, with some continuity, but richly complex and able to surprise. Former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, my former boss, was very good at this. Whatever issues he faced, be it Russian aggression in Europe, the rise of ISIL in Iraq and in Syria, climate change, or even a foundering defense program. He tried to see the situation in time and in space. He read voraciously, particularly history, biography, literature, and of course news and commentary, looking for common threads that offered context. He asked tough questions, posed alternative futures, and chafed against the pressure to find isolated answers. We can't fix everything, he believed, alone or with a pinpoint solution. Many times, he said, we find that the problem, the challenge, the issue can only be solved through an evolving process of solutions, ultimately getting to the high ground of resolution. And that, for me, is classic Chuck Hagel. Strive for resolution, not just solution. In other words, keep it in perspective. Other perspectives to remember are those outside your immediate sphere, especially those uh, from people who may not agree with you. I refer to this as wits. W-W-T-S. It means, what would they say? The they, being your opponents, 
constituents, critics, and even some supporters, anyone with whom you might need to communicate your decision. Applying wits to your decision-making process not only forces you to game out your rebuttal to tough criticism, but if used wisely, can help you craft a more balanced and more sustainable policy. It's about compromise to some degree, but so too is it about good sense, civility, practicality. I think that's one of the things Mr. Clement has tried to accomplish with his village squares here at St. Petersburg College. But it's also what I believe we try to accomplish at the Pentagon when, before a decision is reached, we reach out to experts, to key legislators, to columnists, military families, and special interest groups, soliciting their reactions and garnering their opinions. To some degree, sure, it's about helping us prepare for the tough questions that we're going to be asked at press conferences or in congressional testimony. That's my job, to make sure that you're not surprised. But more than anything else, it's an honest attempt to bridge divides and to make changes if required. The military contribution to the Ebola response, I think, is an excellent case study for this. Back in the fall, our troops were sent to Liberia and to Senegal to support international and interagency efforts there. As you all right remember, the, the, the disease was growing rampant, very fast, and there were a lot of concerned people, not just there, but all around the world. Right from the beginning, we said at the Pentagon that we were not going to be treating patients. Our doctors and nurses were not going to actually be treating the patients. Some critics argued that because the military had expertise and we were quite good at treating infectious diseases, that we should play a more active role, that we were holding back, that we were being too cautious. And to be honest, force protection was, of course, a key factor in the minds of military leaders at the time. But yet, senior military leaders still acknowledged that criticism we were getting. They recognized that there were some valid arguments there. So they consulted USAID the lead U.S. agency in this case, as well as the Liberian government, both of which insisted that the most pressing demand was not actually for caregivers, but rather for the facilities and the tools and the infrastructure with which those caregivers could do their jobs. So the military focused on some of the things that we do best, and perhaps most uniquely do best. We built clinics. We sent down mobile laboratories. We established an effective logistics and transport capability. And because so many of these people stricken with the disease were living in very, very austere environments uh, out away from uh, major cities. There were no, no roads. We had to actually build roads to help uh, some of the patients uh, reach uh, des the, the destinations they were trying to reach. We did all this masterfully, avoiding, as we said we would, any direct contact with Ebola patients. When it was time to start sending our troops home, military leaders understood that there would be concerns about exposure and latent manifestations of the disease. At first, they saw no need for a quarantine, just a self-monitoring protocol for our troops. They were just going to watch themselves and see if they developed a temperature. But after reaching out to families and to local communities, people, people who lived in the communities outside the bases that these troops were going to be returning to, who expressed real fears over the spread of Ebola, the military implemented a 21-day controlled monitoring regimen that prevented any contact with returning troops. Not a single member of the armed forces has shown any symptoms of Ebola, but that does not make any less valid the concerns expressed, the safety measures imposed, or the open minds that the military espoused throughout this mission. As a spokesman, I was empowered and encouraged to detail all these measures for the public and to walk reporters through the logic behind them. We permitted media coverage of the pre-deployment training that our troops endured before heading to Africa. We embedded media in various units actually deployed down to Liberia, and we allowed reporters access to the troops as they were going through this quarantine period, this controlled monitoring process. More critically, we continued to listen and to keep our minds open. We kept our wits, so to speak, about us, and we helped stem a terrible outbreak. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings to a close your lesson in Pentagon acronyms. To be honest, and with the exception of Nibbit, I made them all up. <laughs> you can do that when you're a press secretary. Uh, if there is one thing that I hope I have conveyed today, it is the importance of pacing yourself as you make these big decisions and as you discuss these very, very important issues that this conference is designed to discuss. There are some important decisions you can't put off. There's media queries you have to answer, emails you can't avoid anymore. When life and limb are at stake, Yes, by all means, as General Allen did, act quickly, of course. But in the realm of policymaking, when bigger equities must be considered, when a future we cannot predict and may never see, we may never see, rests yet on our good judgment, when more people from more agencies depend on our performance, 
And when a public already overwhelmed with information demands clarity and context, slow down. Don't make a decision before you need to make it. When you do make it, align it to your core values and to the future that you seek and your community seeks. And when you get up to explain those decisions, make sure you can say that you heard all sides and that maybe even you changed your mind a little bit. If you can do those things, you can lead and communicate more effectively. Your decisions will be sustainable and defensible, and you can spur real and lasting change. And just as critically, you'll be a lot happier at COB, close of business. <laughs> Thanks very much. to leadership decision making uh, really profound. I, mean, I, I will tell you that, uh, start with Nibbit. That, that, is a, that is a decision making tool, is, is a remarkable approach. But I do have, I have one question for you because you have had an opportunity, you presented several st case studies of some very significant events in recent history. The decision makers that you have uh, been with, that you have had the opportunity to watch them work through these issues. Have you noticed a, an approach to decision making that actually leads with their own conviction and then tries to present that conviction to the American people? Or in fact tries to incorporate the diversity of opinion of the American people to then make the decision on behalf of the collective will? That's a great question, sir. Um, there's, a, there's so many examples of that. I think um, decision making in the Pentagon, anything in the Pentagon can be difficult. Um, it's a big organization, uh, and there's lots of equities and cultures, inside cultures there in the Pentagon. Um, but I can tell you that uh, as the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, deal with these, some of these very, very thorny issues, like ISIL in Iraq and Syria, which I know is a great concern too. American people, they do the best they can to uh, to try to think through all the ramifications of, of each decision they're making. And and just as importantly, and I used to hear Secretary Hagel talk about this all the time, was the unintended consequences. Uh, so what next? Um, for instance, I mean, uh, on, on uh, ISIL, um, it isn't just an Iraq problem, it's a Syria problem, and it's also, as you know, sir, a regional problem. And so before we got to the point where we started to conduct kinetic strikes in Iraq, for instance. That was a big decision. We had, at that point, only just been doing humanitarian assistance um, and uh, trying to protect our, our own embassy personnel. But to, to actively decide that you're going to do uh, strikes, big decision. Um, very, so two things. One, it was very inclusive of not just Pentagon equities, but other interagency equities. So as you might imagine, there were many, many uh, interagency discussions about this over at the White House, including, you know, which included the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, of course the intel community. Obviously it was up to the Commander-in-Chief to finally make that call that he was going to do that, but it was very inclusive, number one. Number two, it also was taken very much with an eye towards uh, uh, what next. So, so how are we going to conduct this campaign effectively? What are the goals, what are the goals we're going to seek? And, and just as importantly, what are the limits we're going to put on ourselves with respect to how we're going to conduct these kinetic strikes? And yes, there's always in a situation like that, or whether it's uh, Russian ag aggression in Ukraine and, and the degree to which we are or are not going to uh, give Ukrainian armed forces uh, lethal arms, um, there's, always a, there's always a frank discussion and, try, and an understanding to try to understand where the American people will be on a decision like that. Now, leadership, as you know, sir, doesn't just mean that um, that, uh, that you, you always follow the dictates of public opinion. Sometimes you have to lead public opinion and make hard calls that you know are going to be controversial or maybe not well received in certain parts of the country. But, but as, as long as, as, you know, back to some of the principles I talked about, if you've thought this through, if you've been inclusive, you've allowed for your critics to have a vote and a voice, um, you can eventually then at least 
better defend that decision and, and better speak about it with the, with the kind of context that it requires. So I think, you know, whether it's, again, our arms uh, uh, to uh, Ukraine, how much or how, how, much, how much we are or are not going to do uh, against ISIL, all those are decisions that senior Pentagon leaders really do uh, try to think through as completely as possible. Please, one more time, let's thank Admiral Kirby and Mike Sanders. Thank you. I will tell you, the travel down here, his appearance here was done, uh, obviously voluntarily. We couldn't uh, make you do it, but uh, it was done on, on his own volition, at his own expense, on his own time, to give back to the Pinellas County community and to his home. So thank you very much. Thank you.